Welcome to another episode of Rock Shovels and Manuscripts. I'm Rick and I'm here with Steve. Hey Rick. Hey Steve. Hey, you know, I was thinking, last episode we talked a little bit about tells and I was telling the people how a tell is like- That a, is so bad. I don't know how else to say it, man. If your first name was William, then that would be telling. <laughs> <laughs> well, as I was saying, yes. a tell is an artificial mountain mm -hmm. that's layered from Hist or, you know, history, yes. different layers of civilization. And I was just wondering if that's where the famous song comes from, Go Tell It on the Mountain. Oh, that is so <laughs> bad. Because I was thinking as you're describing what a tell is, that that kind of sounds like my desk. The lower you go on papers, the further back in time. You know, the further back in time. So. Tell is the ancient Hebrew word for Rick's desk. <laughs> Sedimentary layers of yeah. papers. So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna visit the biggest tell in Israel, Tel Hazor, Chatzor. Okay. And a little history from the book of Joshua. Now this is significant. As is often the case, what we're doing here is debunking modern archeology span mm -hmm. when it disagrees with the Bible. Yes. The Bible mentions Chatzor several times. It was a major city. Joshua went there and destroyed it. Archaeology tells us, no, that didn't happen. It, this was destroyed at another time. Joshua couldn't have done it. Now they're starting to see that the details line up beautifully with the book of Joshua. And there always seems to be a, a difference between liberal archaeology and conservative archaeology yes. or biblical archaeology. And it's funny that biblical archaeology lines up with the facts and liberal archaeology lines up with the theory Yes. Of the researcher who doesn't like to deal with the Bible and its facts. It, it really seems to be the case. <laughs> yeah. no, it really does. It's not far-fetched at no. all. All right, so Joshua 10, verses 40, and I'll be reading some other version, uh, verses as well. So Joshua subdued the whole region, including the hill country, the Negev, the western foothills, and the mountain slopes, together with all their kings. He left no survivors. He totally destroyed all who breathed, just as the Lord God of Israel had commanded. So I included this verse to remind everybody that this was what Joshua was told to do. Mm -hmm. He was told to kill everybody. And there were certain cities that were told to be totally annihilated, that people couldn't even take any booty from the cities, like Jericho. Yes. Chatzor is one of the cities that is, and ends up being totally destroyed. Chapter 11. Here's what happened. When Jabin, the king of Chatzor, heard of this, Joshua destroying all these cities, he sent word to. And then in the next several verses are all the various kings. So what he did, he was the head king. He called all the other kings, the Perizzites, the Amorites, yes. the Hivites, and the said, termites. We, and the termites, yeah. <laughs> we've got a problem. These Israelite upstarts from Egypt have come and they're destroying all the kingdoms. Unless we unite, they'll destroy us too. Let's unite and put an end to the Hebrew menace. Yes. So there's this massive army against Joshua. Now, Joshua was a man of God, so I won't say he was scared. But if there is ever a time to be scared, mm -hmm. this would be the time. On a physical level, there's no way they could have won. Here's what the scripture says. I'm in Joshua 11, verse four. They came out with all their troops and a large number of horses and chariots, a huge army, as numerous as the sand on the seashore. All these kings joined forces and made camp together to fight against Israel. Now, one of the things I see immediately is them having chariots tells me that they're an advanced fighting system. They're, they're using advanced warfare. Interesting thing, we know the um, Egyptians had chariots. Yes. And God destroyed their chariot army in the sea. Um, these guys have chariots. We don't read anything about Israel having no, chariots. we don't. So imagine in warfare today, you send foot soldiers against a tank battalion. Mm -hmm. It's very similar. Yes. You're gonna lose. Right. Chariots were the tanks of their day. Um, they were highly superior to just foot soldiers and they could mow down foot soldiers. They would have spikes on their wheels and they would just mm -hmm. go through plowing people over. And we also know about the Israelites that iron technology for them was way late in history compared to when it first began in the other areas. Uh, we have former slaves fighting trained soldiers with inferior technology. Yes. Everybody's gonna put their money 
<laughs> on Katsur. <laughs> yes. But we're in backwards world, as a <laughs> friend right. of mine calls it. <laughs> and let's see what happened. The Lord said to Joshua, ah, don't be afraid of them. By this time tomorrow, I'll hand them all over to Israel slain. Verse eight, and the Lord gave them into the hand of Israel. They defeated them and pursued them until no survivors were left. Mm -hmm. And at that time, verse 10, Joshua turned back and ca captured Chatzor and put its king to the sword. Chatzor had been the head of all these kingdoms. That's significant. Mm -hmm. Now we know this wasn't just a city state. This was the head of all the kingdoms in the area. Everyone in it they put to the sword. They totally destroyed them, not sparing anything that breathed, and he burned up Chatzor itself. Burned. That's mm -hmm. a key word yes. because in the archaeology record, the record that says Joshua burned Chatzor in the Bible matches the archaeology record. There's this huge burn area in the tell. Ah, we know it was destroyed. But based on our research, it doesn't line up with the Joshua story. Based on conservative research, it lines up perfectly sure. with the Joshua story. Absolutely. So Joshua took all these royal cities and their kings and put them to the sword. He totally destroyed them as Moses, the servant of the Lord, had commanded. Yet Israel did not burn any of the cities built on their mounds except Chatzor, which Joshua burned. What did Joshua do to Chatzor? We're told at least three times, burned it. Yes. And so we dig up at Tal Chatzor and we find in a total destruction layer, burnt by fire, Joshua's undoubtedly his destruction of Chatzor. As I mentioned before, it's the largest of the Tells. We just saw Chatzor was the head of all these kingdoms. It was now a 200 acre Tell. That's what they've dug up. Uh, 200 acres. That's you, I think that's still a pretty good size town. That is huge. Yeah, yeah 200 acres is big. I, I, I can't even, you know, I, my in-laws have some property. They have 40 acres. And it's like five times that. And yeah, and I'm wondering, know, it is Tel Chatzor, uh, is the mound itself on 200 acres or only a part of it? And then it extends beyond the Tel itself. I'm not sure. I haven't been there. I'm just basing this on the research I've done. Have you been to Chatzor yet? I haven't, but yeah. Beit Sion uh, has a, a large area that's a tell plus in the background, yeah. plus all the yeah. lower area. That's huge. I would think at 200 acres, it would have to be the tell and. I would think. But I would think so. yeah. it is a huge tell, nevertheless. Yes. So when the Lord, um, in Deuteronomy 7, to give some more information to this, remember, Joshua totally destroyed Jericho. He totally destroyed Chatzor. He killed all the people in the area. We talked about this in a previous lesson. The people who lived in the land of Canaan were under God's judgment for horrific sins. They were as disgusting and evil as people could be. So God told Joshua, I want them destroyed. It was like Sodom and Gomorrah. It was like the flood of Noah. An entire civilization, here are many, many civilizations, had become so corrupt that God has chosen to destroy them. Mm -hmm. But instead of fire from heaven, instead of a flood, instead of the walls falling down, he's chosen to send soldiers in to mm -hmm. kill them. Mm -hmm. This is the text that type of thing is based on. When the Lord your God brings you into the land you are entering to possess and drives out before you many nations, the Hittites, the Girgashites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, the Jebusites, Seven nations, larger and stronger than you. And when the Lord your God has delivered them over to you and you have defeated them, then you must destroy them totally. Make no treaty with them. Show them no mercy. Do not intermarry with them. Do not give your daughters to their sons or take their daughters for your sons. For they will turn your sons away from following me to serve other gods. And the Lord's anger were will burn against you and quickly destroy you. That is absolutely one of the keys to why it was important to eradicate them from the land. Yeah, they were a contagion. Yes. Interesting thing, we didn't do it. We didn't totally annihilate them. And exactly what God said would happen through Moses happened. Our people intermarried. They adopted their pagan practices. It even happened to King Solomon himself. Mm. He married these foreign wives. They seduced him into following foreign gods. And Solomon, whom God appeared to on multiple occasions, ended up turning his back on God and following idols. It's, it's a horrible thing. Now, the sins that these people were committing, 
idolatry, bestiality, murder, incest, 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 I can't speak. Any evil and vile thing you can think of was part of their culture. God said, for this, I'm dispossessing them and you will get their land. Do not do like they did. Mm -hmm. Because if you do, I will dispossess you. Well, guess what? We became dispossessed. We were kicked out of the land. God said, not only did we end up doing the same things they did, but we did them worse. The biblical story is one of hope, but there are, there are valleys in it of despair. Yes. And that's one of those valleys. Yes, it is. Yeah. And sadly, it lasted for generations. There are, within Judah, the southern empire, it would say such and such a king reigned and he was good like David and he would lead a revival. Then another king would reign and say he did not re reign like David and they would worship idols again. And it went back and forth and yes. back and forth. But in the northern kingdom, they started their kingdom with idolatry and it ended with idolatry. There was never a good king, mm. not one kid king. Even Jehu, who took Baal worship out of the north, didn't stop worshiping the golden calves that Jeroboam set up in Dan and Bethel. So here we have God telling the Israelites, you go in and destroy them all because of all these wicked things they do. Just don't do like they do. And over time, sadly, we ended up doing like they do. This is what you are to do to them. Break down their altars, smash their sacred stones, cut down their Asherah poles, and burn their idols in the fire. For you are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you out of all the peoples on the face of the earth to be his people, his treasured possession. This is one of the verses where Israel is called the chosen people. Mm -hmm. The Lord did not set his affection on you and choose you because you are more nu numerous than other peoples, for you are the fewest of all the peoples. But it was because the Lord loved you and kept the oath he swore to your forefathers that he brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the land of slavery, from the power of the king of Egypt. Now we'll take a break here. And just a couple moments after our break, I want to jump forward to a New Testament parallel, something that's just like this, but in the New Testament. I love it. This is great. Yeah, it's good stuff. Uh, you know, I, I keep thinking about the tragedy of having to remove a people from the land, but it has to be done. It's like sin in our own lives. For us to be holy, we have got to remove the things that would keep us from serving God. But there is one big difference. Israel's judgment and displacement was temporary never permanent. God promised they would always be restored to their land as we've seen it is to this day. Absolutely. How wonderful. Okay. Well, look, we're going to come right back. So don't you go away. GLC invites you to visit us on our Facebook page at facebook.com forward slash GLC TV. Here you can stay in touch with all of the latest GLC news along with daily scriptural inspirations, current specials in our bookstore, links to our newest shows and online media, plus articles from trusted sources. Feel free to drop us a message or a question by posting to our page. Please help us out and like our page by clicking on the thumbs up button. Don't delay. Drop by the GLC Facebook page at facebook.com forward slash GLC TV. We want to interact with you today. Welcome back to Rock Shovels and Manuscripts with Rick and Steve. Okay, Steve, you said you were going to point us to some New Testament parallels. Yes, here's the thing. The people who lived in the land were wicked. God told us not to intermarry with them and not to do like they do. Now, we jump forward to 2 Corinthians, and this is what it says. Do not be yoked together with unbelievers. For what do righteousness and wickedness have in common? Or what fellowship can light have with darkness? What harmony is there between Messiah and Belial? What does a believer have in common with an unbeliever? What agreement is there between the temple of God and mm -hmm. idols? For we are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will live with them, walk among them, and I will be their God, and they will be my people. Therefore, come out from them and be separate, says the Lord. Touch no unclean thing, and I will receive you. I will be a father to you, and you will be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. There are so many believers today that think it's acceptable to date and marry 
non-believers. Mm -hmm. Some of them have it within their mind, oh, I'll win them to the Lord. Others, I don't know why they do it, but to me this passage seems pretty straightforward. Don't be yoked together with unbelievers. Let me tell you some of the things that happen. Imagine this scenario, and I've seen it time and time again. One of the spouses believes, one of the spouses does, doesn't believe. They have children. The believing spouse wants to take them to church, wants to share the Lord with them and raise them in a godly fashion. The unbelieving spouse does not. The unbelieving spouse may mock the faith, may inspire and lead the child not to attend church. Now the believing spouse now has a child that doesn't follow God and she's scared to death. Mm -hmm. He's scared to death that the child is going to die in their sin. If only I had listened to Steve when he said, don't marry, don't date a non-believer. What have I done? My child's soul is at risk and it's my fault. This is the real consequence of that sort of thing. Uh, sad thing is I've seen it too in yeah. ministry. Yep. And it happens over and over again. And it's always with that, if you will, delusion of thinking that they're going to make the difference. Yep. And it's much better for them to not do that. And that was the consequences of the next generation. Not, you know, the spouse that's always fighting with the other spouse about going to services instead of tithing or donating to God instead of. It's a constant, miserable struggle. Right. Then there's the holiness aspect. So you've got the children, mm -hmm. you've got your own comforts, and then you've got the holiness aspect. How can you be fully and completely dedicated to God when you're constantly being torn down? Yeah. It's, a, it's a horrible distraction. A household is really living between two worlds yeah. and two mindsets. Yep. And a double, an, a double minded man is mm -hmm. unstable in all his ways. Mm -hmm says the scripture. And so is the household. So my advice to you is don't even date a non-believer. They might be wonderful people, good looking, friendly, fun, and maybe the perfect mate, as long as they believe like you believe. But if not, it's not worth it, don't do it. This whole idea of following idols is abhorrent to us, we get that. Committing all these gross sins, we get that. Mm -hmm. But in our culture, the similar thing we don't get. No. And we do. Right. Yeah, we practice some of the same things just in different ways. Yep. And basically, we allow them to steal our hearts from the Lord. Exactly. The lesson from Chatzor. Yes. So, there are some additional things that have been dug up at Tel Chatzor. Um, they've got some remains that date all the way back to the time of the Canaanites, which, of course, would be the days of Joshua and before. Yes. Um, in the lower city, they had some cultic structures and some religious figurines and standing stones that were found. Mm -hmm. Speaking of which, listen to Leviticus 26.1. Do not make idols or set up an image or a sacred stone mm -hmm. for yourselves. So Leviticus talks about sacred stones. We don't know what sacred stones are, but we've dug them up. Right. So now we know what they are. You could really say that the Bible is coming alive through... Archaeology. Yeah, it helps us understand so much better than we did previously. And I like this. Don't make yourselves idols, an image, a sacred stone. Don't d bow down before it. It's just a re repetition, re repeating mm -hmm. the Ten Commandments, the yes. Second Commandment. Don't make anything yes. to bow down to worship before mm -hmm. it. What is it with people wanting to worship things? I, I think it's built within us to have devotion to, to someone. I think you're right. We have to. Mm -hmm. We're, we're humans, we're made in God's image. Yes. And if that image is corrupted, we'll worship something else. And the sad thing is, is sometimes that can be an individual, could be a spouse, could be a child, could be a parent, could be a place that we work at. It could be a number of things, but there's the tendency to bow down to something. You know, if I'm not mistaken, the New Testament says covetousness, which is idolatry. Mm -hmm. I suppose anything that we set our heart on mm -hmm more important than God to us. Now, we don't worship idols. We don't make statues and bow down before them. But what if you love football so much mm -hmm. and all the games are conflicting with the things you could be doing in service at your congregation? Right. Isn't that an idol? It certainly could be. 
and now and I'm going to get really personal, and I don't mean to offend. You're mature. You're going to have to figure out how this works in your own life, and maybe you have. But what if your kids' sports mm -hmm. constantly conflict with your responsibilities or what could be your responsibilities at your local congregation? I agree. I think that can be an idol as well. I think so, too. And I'm not sure if it's the activity or the praise you want for your children. I'm not sure which is the idol in that case, but... Whatever it is that's distracting us from God, we've got to stop mm -hmm. and let God come first. Yes, absolutely. All right, so there's some Canaanite structures. They even found a gate done in the style of other buildings that Solomon commissioned. So we've got ancient Canaanite stuff. We've got a Solomonic gate there. Um, 1 Kings 9.15, here is the account, here is the account of the forced labor King Solomon conscripted to build the Lord's temple, his own palace, the supporting terraces, the wall of Jerusalem, and Chatzor, there you go. Megiddo, and Gezer. Wow, that <laughs> is really cool. So we know for a fact that he rebuilt Chatzor, Megiddo, and Gezer. When you go to Megiddo, they believe they found some of Solomon's stuff. When you go to Chatzor, they believe they've found some of Solomon's stuff. I've not been to Gezer. I don't know if they found his stuff there or not. The Bible, once again, coming alive. And go there and touch it. Yeah, and really, <laughs> a lot of this I think we take for granted is really over the last mm, 200 years or maybe even less that so many discoveries have been made. It's pretty incredible. In one of the books I've read about modern archaeology, they say that uh, Napoleon is the father of modern archaeology. Mm -hmm. Who would have thought? Yeah. You know? But the, I guess the first time to do scientific research mm -hmm. on ancient sites. Now, there have always been people who've dug stuff up and took it as a treasure. Sure. But to actually mark where it was located, mm -hmm try to determine how the people of the time use that device or what it means to that time. Mm -hmm. And then when we jump forward, you said within the last 200 years, absolutely. We went yeah. from virtually ignoramuses yes. to extremely knowledgeable mm -hmm. and still just scratching the surface. Ah, uh, literally. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is why uh, when we're talking about Napoleon, why the Louvre is so incredible to go through because of these types of discoveries, that things were found and then brought back to other places. In fact, in England, in other places, in Europe, um, in Turkey, but especially in England, you can go to a school or a museum, and in their archives, there might be a thousand ancient manuscripts mm -hmm. or clay tablets yes. with Ugaritic yes. or Canaanite writing all over them that nobody has ever mm -hmm. translated. Right. And there they sit to this very day. Because there's not a lot of money put into archeological research. No, and how many people read Ugaritic or Canaanite? There's so, you count them on one hand. Yeah, I, I, that was gonna be right after English. So I'm still working You're still on working it. on it? <laughs> you know, I'm tempted, just because I know that treasure trove is there, mm -hmm. who knows what kind of knowledge and That's data. True. If all these things you and I have learned from the archeological finds of the last 200 years, help us understand the Bible so much better, God so much better, who knows how much better still. I know. I, you know, I'm just chomping it, at the bit. Exactly. Well, they found um, water system. Now we've talked about water shafts before. Yeah. I think it was Gibeon and Megiddo. Yes. And yet they found one here. It says the shaft goes down about 60 feet. Hmm. And then it levels out and it goes deeper still, which makes sense. I mean, I live in Tucson. It's a very desert place. And depending on where you are in the hills and stuff, you might have to sink a well a couple hundred feet deep. I mean, yeah. it, it's not and, unheard of. And this is, even without looking at the notes that you have on here, it sounds very similar to Megiddo. Yeah. Yeah, it yep. really does. They believe it had some of the same kings yes. were working on some of the same. Because I remember it goes down, it levels off, it goes down again for another yeah. shaft. So they found a storehouse or a stable there as well. And they say storehouse or stable because they're not sure. They dig mm -hmm. up something, mm -hmm. they look at it, and they say, hmm, what's this for? They just know it's not falling down, so it's probably stable. Oh. <laughs> oh I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> Spare me. <laughs> you see what I have to put up with? <laughs> probably the stables for the Royal mm -hmm. Cavalry. Yeah. 
But again, as I've said before, archaeology is an art and a science. Mm -hmm. It wouldn't be too different than if you and I found something. In fact, it's fun. Uh, in some of the magazines I read, like a Biblical Archaeology Review, they'll show us something and they'll say, we don't know what this is. Does anybody have any ideas? That's right. And they want people who are educated and knowledgeable to give their theories as to what those things are. And they actually listen. It's yeah. pretty cool that it we can contribute cool. to modern yeah. archaeology this way. Well, now with the internet, I mean, you can go online and so many artifact museums of artifacts are online where you can search through now. I like it. I like the idea that um, they're willing to, in instances, acknowledge their ignorance and leave things subject to debate or interpretation. Mm -hmm. And maybe if they could just take that a little farther and maybe acknowledge that where the Bible speaks, maybe it is true, mm -hmm. not just discount it out of hand and maybe use it as their guide, we would get further still in the discoveries that they're making. And this is probably one of the reasons that we really greatly need more biblical archaeologists today. People that believe the word of God and they're going out and they're looking for the evidence. And, and it's, there's a ton of it. It's everywhere. If you go to Israel, you can actually request to visit and live dig and participate in the sifting and the scraping and the digging. That's right. I think Biblical Archaeology Review always has those kind of digs going on. Yeah, that you can they're almost for. always available. Yeah. And what a life changing event. I did a little bit of uh, just a little bit of digging in Egypt and it, it was fascinating. And, you know, we actually find stuff. So I would do it, but I don't dig. You don't dig? No, I hire people to dig. <laughs> I'm talking about in your yard. <laughs> if I can't put a tree in there, why dig it up? Okay. <laughs> well, I hope that you're digging this show. And uh, we really enjoy doing this for you. Rock shovels and manuscripts. Uh, Steve, thanks as always. And we will see you next time. Ciao. This episode was produced by and for God's Learning Channel. If you're enjoying this series, your financial support will help us keep this program on the air. Simply send your contribution to God's Learning Channel, P.O. Box 61000, Midland, Texas 79711-1000. Or log on to our website at www.glc.us.com and donate using PayPal. Please be sure to designate which program your contribution is intended to support. Thank you for helping us make unique quality programming a reality. Order your copy of this program from the GLC Bookstore by calling the numbers or visiting the website on your screen. Please include the program number when ordering.